class. I wasn't some amazing student. I didn't like read all the time. You know, I did well in what I was interested in. Um, and if I wasn't interested, there was nothing you could have done to make me do it. Um, you know, I, I, no, I was like, I, I was popular in the popular group, but I always felt, well, I wasn't conscious of this, but there, un- subconsciously, unconsciously, that that wasn't really me, you know? And I, you know, it was sort of like, um, this is, you know, they want me in this group. I sort of have the characteristics of the group, um, or, you know, could, the physical, or whatever, exterior. But so, so, so I went through a long period of kind of like, um, pretending, you know, um, not wearing my real self, if that makes any sense. Well, expand on that a little bit. What do you mean? Well, um, you know, not being true to who I was. I was just kind of like, you know, I was, I was with the popular girls because, you know, that seemed like the right thing to do, to be, you know, in a popular group as opposed to being with the, with the kids that I had been close to in elementary school who, you know, I really connected with sort of soul to soul as opposed to a zip code or a, what kind of coat you had or what kind of clothes you, you know, your parents could afford to buy. And, and so... So that's what I mean. And I and I have to think somewhere, though, in my back of my brain that I knew that success was really going to be when I would connect with my real self. And that started happening around in college, you know, where I felt free to be, you know, free to be you and me, you know, free to be who I, who I was. And what did that look like? Um, well, that's when the sort of, quote, successful, the notion of success entered my brain. What did that look like? I went to Howard University. So people think you go to a black school, historically, historically black college, that, you know, everybody's black and it's not a real environment. It's just like, it's like black and, you know, you're all the same. And what happens, or you go there because it's black, what happens is, The beautiful thing about that, and I think it's it's similar at women's colleges, race becomes ancillary. And so it's character. It's all about character because you're all the same race. Obviously, you are not all the same. And so what happens is you get to be in that space. You get to play in that space. You get to grow in that space where it's it's not about the color. It's not about perception of what people bring to you because of your race. You know, it's just who you are. You're a jerk. You're great. You're warm. You're selfish. You're arrogant. You're whatever. You're able to be all of those things and not be like, oh, you're that way because you're black. Of course you're that way. You're lazy because you're black. You know, none of that. You you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. So during that time in your life, did you return to that elementary school being who you really are person or did you evolve and go somewhere else? Well, well, both. It was like I took her with me. You know, I evolved into someone who took school seriously and who had a vision. You know, I had a vision finally for myself um, in in the future. So, you know, I I, I put my head down and I, and that way, you know, and I, and I I think that it was, um, easier to do that in a in an environment where you know you had really supportive professors who really cared about you and where you're going to go from there you know and um so i was uh i was uh, editor of the student paper and editor of the student paper i was um in student government so i did all these things i don't know that i would have done if i had gone to a majority school maybe i would have but you know i just did a lot, and and so that led to internships, and that led to this and that, and you know, so it, it was good. Um, and this friend that I I talked about earlier, um, you know, I met him there. You know, I met him in college, and we're still friends. You know, thirty five years later, um, you know, and we couldn't be more different in terms of background. I mean, he grew up, you know, in the south in a little tiny town, you know, and was an only child, and. 
I, you know, we're just, you know, I, I, like I said, our backgrounds are, but we're very much the same inside. Um, and I made friends like that there, lifetime, lifelong friends. And at what point did you start to feel what we commonly refer to as success in the professional sense? You get the job, you end up working for the premier black women's magazine, one of the premier mm. publications in the country of all magazines. Mm-hmm. It's well regarded, mm-hmm. well read. Um, mm-hmm. I always wanted to write the Say Brother. What was the part of the... Yeah, the, Brothers column, Brothers column, yeah. Yeah, yeah I yeah. always wanted to write mm-hmm. that column. I mean, I read mm-hmm. it. It was, yeah, it was, it was yeah. a, it was, it, it, and it continues to be. It's a very well regarded mm-hmm. piece, publication, mm-hmm. your books. When did that start to happen? Or when did you start to feel that that part of your life sort of um, take You know, James, I, ne- I never, like, really, like, felt it, like, ooh, I'm successful. You know, it was just like, you know, you, you're doing your thing every day. I remember one time when I first got the job at People Magazine and I moved to New York and walking up to the building, and it's this very impressive, you know, the timing building itself, you know, huge building. It takes up, you know corner of 50th and 6th Avenue is across the street from Radio City Music Hall. You know, it's just all, you know, it's like the height of New York. And I'm walking across the plaza and there's a water fountain everything. And and I had this song in my head, popped in my head from the um, Mary Tyler Moore. You remember that um, sitcom, Mary Tyler Moore? Yeah. And the song was, you're gonna make it after all. Right. And I ha- <laughs> it came in my head and I smiled and I did kind of had this extra step it was like okay you know but other than that like i mean obviously i had moments you know i went to i went to france uh for essence to interview bill t jones you know i had a moment there but for the most part no you're just like working your butt off you know and you know that's it i mean look i was around people who were like superstars in their field when i started my first day at essence um, Susan Taylor, the renowned editor of uh, Essence, uh, who was a love, she was wonderful for me. She just loved me, and I loved her, and she embraced me on the first day. And she had never seen me before. She came over to my desk and, you know, hugged me, welcome. She said, let's go to lunch, and I'm taking you to lunch today. You, okay. Susan Taylor said, let's go to lunch? Yeah, yeah. Oh, she's, wow. I mean, she's, she's my boss. She's my boss, so, you know, she just... But how cool so, is that? I mean, she's like the woman. <laughs> Yes, exactly, exactly. Wow. And, you know, we get in the elevator, and this girl sees her, because Essence didn't have its own building, building on my time in. So this is, who knows, from another floor. She starts literally jumping up and down. Oh, my God, this is here. Oh, my God. And literally jumping up and down in the elevator. And Susan, always cool, always gracious, reaching in, she's beautiful, the braids, it always looks elegant, whatever she's wearing even drift down. She puts her hand on the woman and she says, you know, she smiles and hello and what's your name? And she's trying to get her to calm down, but she's just being gracious. And I'm there with her and I'm going like, this is like being with Michael Jackson. So I'm never feeling like I'm all that because I'm with people like her. Right. You know? Right. And so. What was the progression of that post-college marriage, mom, kids, husband, period like for you was it just grueling work i'm busy i'm running that new york crazy time schedule where you get into manhattan and you can just the energy is palpable you can feel the stress in the air yeah. I mean, because people mm-hmm. are doing big things and a lot of mm-hmm. it and fast what was that portion like if you have a sense of well it? when i was living in new york by myself i was into it. I totally loved, 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 I never thought I, I would leave. I didn't want to leave. Um, I loved living in the city. And, you know, I've been there for uh, almost uh, 10 years, nine years, something like that, when I met my husband. And, you know, so I was like in my early 30s or approaching mid 30s. So it was like, okay, you know, once, once we got married, it's like, okay, TikTok, got to get, you know, these babies happening if we're going to have them. Well, I knew I wanted them so or one <laughs> so mm-hmm. and then uh, i was working at essence and it was just a lot you know it was a lot to be married to somebody who talks a lot my husband talks a lot and is a lot as a big personality 
and you know my job was big and required a lot of talking and interacting and being on and I'd be at work and be on and come home and 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 need to be on to deal with him and was like, oh, this is exhausting. So after, you know, I don't know, about six months, I, and I had I had started with hair. I started writing the book. And I started writing it years ago, and I really wanted to finish this book. Short story long, I quit my job to finish good hair. And I did that. And But in doing that, um, I gave up sort of my bargaining power to live in the city, to live where we were living, and, you know, live on one salary. So I did, we did that. I made that, you know, uh, compromise or that decision. And, uh, and then I finished the book because he was like, no baby till you finish that book. And I did. That was a really great thing that he made me do. I will forever be grateful to him for that. And I, um, finished good hair and then we sold it. My agent sold it and then we got pregnant. And so, and that's why I was doing my thing, you know, had the baby, had the book, had another book, had another book, got the baby. My my mom was helping with the baby and all that. So things were good, but things were fine. And then I had another baby, but it was years later. Then my mom got sick. Then I'm home. I decided to take some time off. Because uh, my mom was too old to take care of my son the way she had taken care of my, my daughter. I decided to take, home, take off one year after my fourth book was done. And my contract was up. And I said, okay, I'll renegotiate another contract after a year. And I was also exhausted because the books were successful. And so I was touring, writing, touring, writing. It was, I was tired. Um, and I thought, okay, give this time to forward, you know, catch your breath, and then get back to work. Well, one year turned into two, two years turned into three, three years turned into six. And that period is pretty much what I really focus on in the book because that's when I started going down. And then during that period, my mother died, and then I went all the way down. I fell over. So that's what happened. <laughs> you know, now I know I need both to be stimulated mentally and emotionally, um, um, and, and but also I need downtime. I need um, quiet time. I need to be, I need some time for, for introspection, you know, and I didn't know that then. My guest is Benilde Little. She is an author. She has written a number of books. She's worked for People magazine. She's worked for Essence. Her books, Who Does She Think She Is, Acting Out, The Itch, Good Hair, and she does have some phenomenal hair. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about depression. Mm -hmm. How do you explain it? How do you <laughs> capture that, that, that idea for yeah. folks? It depends on the day. Sometimes you just get mad. You know, it's like, you know, there's somebody else say something like, yeah, oh, you know, you need to just nap out of it, or you just need a vacation, or you just need fill in the blank. And, you know, I don't get mad at people anymore. Um, but I still do get sometimes, you know, I, I maybe have a too high an expectation of people sometimes. Um God, what does it feel like? You know, I read a lot, um, especially around um, when I was writing the book, to try to help people understand, to try to explain, to try to put into words. And I just borrowed other people's words. Um, you know, David Foster Wallace, you know, wrote Infinite Jet and a bunch of other books, and it was brilliant, who ended up recently, a couple of years ago, committing suicide. He said, it's like a nausea of the soul. And I thought... Yeah, because you know when you feel nauseated, it's like, and I'm saying this for people who don't know what depression feels like, it's just like there. It's just hanging on, you take something, it doesn't get better, uh, doesn't go away until it just is ready to get out of your system. William Styron, with that beautiful book he wrote, um, Darkness Visible, about his depression, but how do you explain it? You know, when people say, you know, okay, just go on vacation. No, you can't even, you can't, you can't even like, you can't make uh, reservations. You know, focusing on, if you say you're online trying to, you know, you can't even like, 
get online and go through the cooking and, and figure out what, what 